Organic Soil Management, narrated and developed by Julie Larson. When you pick up a handful of soil, uh, what? how do you think about it? It just seems like it's a clump of crumbly black um, particles. But actually, soil properties, there's three kind of can bro be broken down into three categories. You have the physical, which is uh, uh, its permeability, or its water holding capacity. Uh, is it able to hold it? Is it able to drain the water? Uh, so the permeability. Then you have the structure, which we think of as uh, either sand, silt, or clay. Uh, clay soils being heavy tend not to drain very well. They hold the water. Um, uh, in most soils are made up of a, a percentage of each of those. Also, the depth of your soil, uh, how far does it go down? Um, very important that you uh, have some sense of that. Then we have the chemical properties of your soil. And the macronutrients would be the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium. We, uh, that's the NPK. You'll see many times on fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, uh, that you can add into your soil to boost the, the chemical nutrients. There's also micronutrients found there, and we'll discuss that more when we get to the soil testing. Um, and the third category would be the biological or the microorganisms that are found in the soil. The bacteria, the fungi, the nematodes, uh, these all contribute to a healthy soil that plants can thrive in. Bacteria uh, in the fungi, the nematodes, the something of a new idea of the living soil, and it's not just the the chemicals you put into it uh, to make uh, things fertile. Uh, very important to have the biological aspects of it for the oxygen exchange, gas exchange, um, and uh, in order for the, the plants to be able to take up the nutrients in the water to the best of their ability. Feed the soil, not the plant. So why is that? You can certainly side dress a plant uh, with the, the extra nutrients that it might need, or you can apply fish emulsion uh, on the plants as a foliar spray for added uh, nitrogen. But overall, you really want to think of your soil as the banquet, right? You want to have those nutrients available to your plants when they need them, uh, depending on what conditions, if it's drought conditions, uh, very rainy conditions. You want to make sure that your soil is the right condition. So if it's, so it's uh, water can drain, or water can be held when it's necessary. Um, you don't want to just have, uh, you know, they don't live in just a little area. Those root systems uh, go out for quite a ways, uh, searching, uh, trying to take in the, the nutrients that it requires. So think of your soil as uh, the place uh, where your plants will be able to um, get all these nutrients, and the better you make that, the healthier uh, your plant will be. Why is it important to increase your soil organic matter? Well, it's the foundation for productive soil. And productive soil, feed the soil, feed your plant. So with really good organic matter in your soil, it's going to increase uh, the overall fertility, uh, improves your soil structure, aeration, and tillability. Uh, and this is going to be important for retaining the nutrients and retaining water. Uh, adding organic matter reduces the bulk, the heaviness of your soil, and this is going to allow for deeper root penetration of your plants. 
uh, uh, excellent soil organic matter also improves the cation exchange capacity which allows better nutrient availability so the fertilizers that you will add or uh, may add uh, the, the plants will be able to use faster and easier and then it also allows the soil to function at the optimal levels and you get the best yields healthy soil healthy plants and many people, so if you have if you have healthy plants, they're less of a target for pests. If you have healthy plants, uh, also the weed uh, uh, issues can be uh, less. It's easier to weed in in very nice soil. Uh, the the weeds come up a lot easier. Uh, many times uh, they don't even a lot of the weeds kind of like a compacted hard soil. They do well in that, and if you give them a nice light soil, they don't, they're not always so happy with that. So it can help with your weed uh, suppression also. A great way to add organic matter to your soil is through compost. And um, composted plant and animal matter, the National Organic Standards, uh, very, very specific guidelines on how compost can be used um, and how the compost must be treated before you're allowed to spread it onto your land. So uh, one of the first things, uh, the temperature, depending on how you're making your compost, if you're doing it in a static or in a vessel aerated pile system, uh, the temperature needs to be between 131 and 170 for three days or uh, between the temperature between 131 or 170 for 15 days if you're using the Woodrow composting system. Uh, and during this time, the, the, uh, the windrows need to be turned a minimum of five times. Also in the production of compost, using the plant and animal materials, you need to establish a carbon to nitrogen ratio between 25 to 1 and 40 to 1. So if there's too much nitrogen, which is considered the green vegetation and manure, your compost is going to get too hot and it's going to heat up and kill all the good microorganisms that you want to retain uh, in the compost. If you have too much carbon, brown, uh, we think of as brown vegetation, your compost will not heat up enough to kill all the pathogens. And this is the one reason why the uh, NOP is really uh, very, very specific about how they want this to be done, because you're going to be spreading this into areas that you're growing food for other people. And if you are using manures, uh, they just want to be sure that what you're spreading in the uptake and what people, you're going to have people, maybe laborers that will be, uh, or interns will be working there. Uh, water will splash up on the fruit if it's not, or vegetables if it's not composted correctly and thoroughly. Those pathogens are still available uh, to be on those, uh, the things that you harvest, your produce. So they are very specific and really, really, really uh, pretty crazy about composting and how you're doing it. So you'll have to maintain records. Uh, if you do choose to use compost uh, from on your farm, you'll have to maintain records. You'll have to show them the records that you have done the temperatures and that you've sent in for testing on your, on your C to N ratio uh, before you have spread that out onto your uh, land. So one way that uh, you can add organic matter to your soils without adding compost or having to go through composting is to uh, use raw manure, but very strict guidelines on how to use raw manure in the fields uh, safely. So 100 day, 120 day pre-harvest interval. 
Uh, and this is, so you, if you have something to harvest in July, you'll have to back out four months before that. So uh, April, you can apply raw manure to your uh, field in April safely uh, as long for the edible portion that has direct contact with the soil surface. So uh, that would be fine. You know, you're probably going to harvest, start harvesting tomatoes maybe late June, early July. If you are doing um, uh, lettuces, four months before that, lettuce is usually a cool season. You're going to have to be applying that raw manure the fall before that uh, in order for it to have a chance to break down and be safe. Now for um, where the edible portion does not come in contact with soil particles, for example, orchard fruit, right? There's a 90-day pre-harvest interval that you can be applying the raw manure. Now, plant matter without manure does not require composting, and that can be applied at any time prior to harvest. So um, if you're going to be using uh, straw for uh, is also a great way to get some lighten up your soil over time um, and break down into your soil that can be applied and it, you can and uses as mulch to suppress weeds that's a great way you don't have to think about um, those uh, uh, pre-harvest intervals Cover crops are a great way to um, cover several different soil management issues. First thing, soil fertility, uh, green manures, they're called because of their ability to uh, fix nitrogen back into the soil. Uh, legumes are great for that. So uh, there's field peas and um, alfalfa will do that. The clovers will do that. Um, so a cover crop is, is used so that you just never have any uh, vacant soil. And so, um, or open soil where nothing is growing. And one of the problems with just having uh, soil and nothing growing on it is that erosion can, can happen, especially if we uh, have some heavy rains. Uh, the water will just take that topsoil right off with it as it uh, uh, seeps down into the ditches. Uh, oats and rye are also uh, really good for preventing soil erosion. Uh, soil structure uh, can really be uh, increased, uh, lightened, um, just uh, makes it a really nice uh, uh, using cover crops that you actually till right back in so you grow them up. Buckwheat's a good example of this. So Buckwheat has several reasons that it's a great uh, plant to use as a cover crop. You grow buckwheat seed, it grows very fast. It actually can compete with the weeds. And uh, honeybees love the buckwheat flowers. They'll be attracted to it and kind of help, especially if you're growing this uh, late in the fall, um, when there's nothing else for the bees to uh, grow or to, to get any pollen or nectar from. They provide a good source. Um, but they also, when, when, the, when it's done flowering, then it's really easy just to till back into the soil and uh, breaks down very, very quickly. Buckwheat is a, a warm weather crop. It does like it to be hot, uh, so you have to plant accordingly. Um, going back to those green manures, uh, one of the reasons that they're able to fix nitrogen is because of the little nodules on their roots that are created by a bacteria uh, bacteria um, that helps the the plants to take uh, the nitrogen out of the air and uh, fixate it into the into through the root system through the nodules and put it back into the soil cover crops are great uh, not used as much as they should be, uh, but that for an organic system, they can be invaluable. One of the really important um, parts of finding out how 
healthy your soil is, is to conduct a soil test. And this is going to help you determine how much and what type of fertilizer, if any, uh, you will need to put into your soil. Um, and so a soil test is going to test for the elements, uh, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, sodium, sulfur, manganese, copper, and zinc. So these are uh, chemically removed from the soil that you send in, the, t the samples that you send in, and then they're measured for plant availability and uh, how much is within that actual sample. The test will also uh, tell you um, the acidity or alkaline uh, of your soil, your pH, and a great place to get a very good soil test. Most soil and water conservation offices uh, many times they're located with the or close to the extension offices uh, in your county. They usually have those for sale. I would highly recommend going there, finding one. Uh, many of the times those will be very specific to your area. Then when you get your soil test back, the results of your soil test, this is what you're going to use to go uh, to your OMRI list of okayed substances and uh, find amendments or supplements that you uh, can add to your soil that falls within the uh, organic standards. For a soil test, the first thing you need to do is uh, you need to get a soil sample. So about seven months, several months, uh, two to three months before you're actually going to do your planting, you need to take some soil samples. So uh, you're going to need to get very uh, clean equipment, uh, no brass, bronze, or galvanized steel because they contain uh, some of the elements that will be um, tested for. You're going to need six to eight samples per unique planting area. So if you are going to be uh, doing vegetables in one area, you have an orchard in a different area, you're going to have a pasture in another area, those would be considered all unique planting areas. And you'll have to take six to eight samples from each of those areas. So those would be separate soil tests for each one. You'll take six to well it's about six to seven inches down and takes what are called soil cores uh, so you don't want any of that topsoil you really want to get to where the soil is that the plants will have available for them to take in the nutrients to see what's really down there let's so take those six to eight samples you're going to mix them together uh, and then send off to the lab and in your soil testing kit will be very specific instructions on how to take the samples um, and they will uh, walk you through it and you'll fill out the paperwork they will uh, everything will be explained on how to package it send it off to the lab and then you're going to get your results and your results are not only going to have um, exactly what the testing tells you but they will also make recommendations. So within that paperwork, there will be a place where they will ask you what you intend to plant there. So it'll be important to have your planting uh, ideas already in your head, what you're going to put in that, uh, so that you really get the most out of the report that comes back from the lab. If you need to add any kind of supplement or amendment to your soil uh, outside of um, compost and using cover crops, uh, if there's something more specific, something that you want to buy, uh, you'll have to go and look and see if it's on what's called the OMRI list, O-M-R-I, which stands for Organic Materials Review Institute. They're a, a nonprofit out of Oregon. They consist of a board of directors who oversee the entire institute. Uh, within the institute is an advisory council that's chosen by the board of directors. And they set the policy and the standards uh, for the, the 
products, what's okay and what's not okay for organic production. Then you have four review panels, and these panels, uh, they're the ones who actually decide or, and review uh, products, uh, actual labeled products that you can go into the hardware store or catalog and buy. And they're broken down into four. So you have uh, a panel that uh, reviews crop products, livestock, for processing plants, uh, and for handling and packaging. All of these items uh, need to be um, recertified if you are going to use them in your um, farm. So you, if you have a question about something, if you pick up something and it doesn't say OMRI listed or OMRI certified, you need to go to your certifying agent and ask them if it's still okay if you use it, even if it's not on the list. They will probably tell you no, that you need to find something else that will work that is on the list. That's kind of the Bible. Uh, the National Organic Program recognizes OMRI as the only list of okayed products. So as you go forward, uh, filling out the Organic Systems Plan and Update, uh, and thinking about how you're going to do that, uh, you want to keep in mind that you need to keep all the labels, um, fertilizer receipts, uh, records of crop rotations, records of composting, uh, how you went about doing that, dates, times, temperatures, uh, any receipts from seeds and plants, and uh, soil testing receipts, the lab you had it done, uh, the results that you got back, your um, Many of these things you will be sending in with your application, your systems plan, and uh, or the inspector that comes out is going to maybe want to take a look at these, but make sure you have them filed and readily available uh, so that um, your certification process can go very smoothly. And you can kind of look at it that, you know, anything that you put on or in the soil, you're going to need to have a record of it. Uh, so dates are really important. Uh, just get in the habit of just keeping everything together and organized.